Dye fog has begun. Let's listen in. During the investigation, Mr. Cheshire offered a number of occasions to allow you to speak personally with Mr. Evans, correct? He offered on one occasion, at least one occasion prior to the indictment, yes, sir. Okay. I believe he offered, do you remember him writing a letter on April 7th and saying that he would be glad to let you sit down and personally speak with Mr. Evans? I don't remember the day. I don't remember that he wrote me a letter. And do you remember that he wrote you another letter on April 28th and renewed that offer and provided you with some information such as a lie detector test? Actually, I believe that's the letter that I remember. If there was a letter prior to that time, I don't specifically recall it. Okay. If I can direct your attention. To Exhibit 208. Yes, sir. And do you see the second page of that letter? Letter from Mr. Cheshire? Yes, sir. And referring to his client there at the second to last paragraph, last sentence, he has fully cooperated in the police investigation and is ready to continue to cooperate by speaking to you personally about the events of the night and answering any follow-up questions you may have and are considering as you are considering the evidence and your charging decision. I just want you to know that David and I are ready to meet with you at your convenience as you make decisions that could significantly affect the rest of his life. Do you recall him writing you that letter and making that offer? I see the letter. I don't have any specific recollection, but I don't have any doubt that he sent it to me under the circumstances. And you never took Mr. Cheshire up on either of these offers to personally speak with Dave Evans before deciding whether to indict him, did you? That's correct. And the reason that you did not take Mr. Cheshire up on his offer was because you believed that Mr. Evans would not confess to the crime or give an incriminating statement. I had no reason to think that he would. On April the 7th, just as an example, I did not know what he would say, but I had a 90 percent identification, and that wasn't enough to go forward with the trial, so I wasn't on that basis at that time considering indicting him on the evidence that I had. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mr. Chairman, I forgot a procedural matter. The copy that we have of Mr. Nyfong's deposition is the official one, and I'd like to have it. Thank you. Yes. But specifically, Mr. Nyfong, the reason that you didn't take him up on that offer was because he wasn't going to confess or give you any incriminating information, right? I certainly didn't expect that he would. And that was the reason you didn't take him up on the offer? That might have been into my consideration, but obviously any time that somebody comes in and speaks to you and makes an exculpatory statement, then you become a witness to that exculpatory statement. So that's the consideration, yes, sir. But I had no reason to think that he would say anything different from what he'd already said. Which was non-incriminating. Yes, sir. And you weren't interested in receiving statements from Mr. Evans if they were non-incriminating. Actually, during this period of time, I wasn't terribly interested in receiving statements from anybody personally. I had asked that anyone who wished to make comments about the case to contact the police because they had more information about the circumstances than I did. I ask you, do you remember I took your deposition for two days last month on May 17th and May 18th? Yes, sir, I do. And your copy of the first day of that deposition? I ask you to follow along and tell me, do you recall at the beginning of that deposition that I asked you, you were under oath, of course, at the deposition? Yes, sir. And I asked you if there was any questions you didn't understand, if you would please let me know that. Do 
you recall? I'm sure you did. I don't specifically recall, but it seems like a reasonable request. All right. And at the end of that deposition, do you remember if I asked you if any of the questions that I asked you thought were unfair or unprofessional in any way? Yes, sir. I do recall you asking me that. And you said you did not feel that way at the end of the deposition? Yes, sir, I did. All right. Mr. Nassar, could you tell me just one other thing? Of course, you. I'm sorry. This will barely face us. I'm sorry. Both we and Ms. Wolfe can hear you better if you do that. If you look at page 241, you see that? Yes, sir. And you see there I'm asking you about the letter specifically that Mr. Evans wrote and why you chose not to interview his client? Yes, sir. And you mentioned that you didn't want to become a witness. And my question was, did you think Mr. Cheshire was attempting to make you into a witness? Is that what you thought he was offering? And you said, not specifically, no, sir, but I just always try to avoid putting myself in that position. Yes, sir. And my question was, is that the reason that you did not take Mr. Cheshire up on his offer to interview Mr. Evans? And your answer was, well, that would be one factor, but I didn't have anything specifically to interview Mr. Evans about. I certainly didn't expect that under these circumstances that Mr. Evans was going to come in and confess to a crime, and he had already made his statement to police. If he was going to make a different statement, then that would be something that he would have the opportunity to make at trial. But the statement he made to police was not an incriminating statement. That was your answer, correct? Yes, sir. And I said, was not, and you said, was not an incriminating statement. So you were only interested in receiving statements from him that were incriminating. Well, I already had his non-incriminating statement. I had, you know, statements from the three people in the house who all said the incident did not occur. Yes, sir. That was. In 28 years as a prosecutor, you have never sat down with a defense attorney before indictment to gain information about the defendant's evidence. Is that correct, to your knowledge? To my recollection. I think your trial testimony here was, if you had evidence, you just present that to the grand jury. If I have credible evidence that persuades me, I think that I have a responsibility before I take a case to trial to be personally persuaded that a crime occurred. If I don't believe that a crime actually occurred, then I cannot ask the jury to return a verdict of guilty. And if you sat down with a defense attorney before indictment, generally if they brought evidence forward, that would probably be exculpatory information or at least mitigating information. Is that a fair statement? I would certainly expect that, yes, sir. And you don't think it's important to get exculpatory or mitigating evidence before the grand jury? Well, there again, I don't appear before a grand jury. And that's why I asked all the attorneys who had information they wanted to give to the police to take that information to the police. I have never been a witness before a grand jury. And so I have asked, as I normally would, if you want to talk about the facts of the case, the police are investigating it. I'm very rarely involved in a case at this stage that this one was when I became involved. And did you direct Mr. Cheshire to have his client go down and speak with police after you got those letters? I did not. But I don't know. I mean, like I said, I don't specifically recall the first letter. But I do recall that there was a telephone call from Mr. Cheshire's office to, and I believe Mr. Bannon may have testified about this. And I don't know the exact circumstances of Mr. Bannon's testimony. Mr. Cheshire or Mr. Cheshire's assistant apparently waited for a long period of time for a response and got the response from someone else in my office. But given the time when that would have likely occurred, my guess is that I was probably involved with somebody else on another matter or perhaps on this matter. And the message that I passed along was the same message I was giving to all the attorneys, which is the police would be very interested in hearing anything your client had to say. If you have something that they would like to say, then please make an appointment with the police. Now, somehow that got translated into Mr. Nyphon wants you to go down and have your client turn himself in and confess, which I don't believe is what was said. 
Okay. And after you got that letter, do you recall getting a letter where that, uh, that was Mr. Cheshire's understanding about what you had said? I do. And he said to you in that letter, did he not, if I've misunderstood this communication, uh, would you please let me know because we'd like to meet with you or words to that effect? He said something along those lines. And did you never call him back to clarify that you, in fact, claim not to have said that? I did not. Um, now, the initial briefing um, by the officers uh, in this case took place sometime between 10 and noon on March 27th. That would be my best recollection. Um, and on that date, uh, you were aware that the three players had made detailed written statements about the evening? Yes, sir. Uh, on that morning, I became aware of that. Yes, sir. And you were aware that these players had voluntarily given DNA and other samples to the Durham Police Department? Yes, sir. <clears throat> and despite this knowledge, you stated to the media on March 27th that my guess is uh, some of this stonewall of silence that you have seen may tend to crumble once charges can come out. Well, I did say that. You did. And um, I was, as I indicated, trying to get other people who had not come forward. We had three out of um, how many other members of the lacrosse team were there, and we were trying to get other people to give us information to it. Right. The three players came down, and they provided statements, and they gave any evidence that was requested without hesitation and without requesting uh, any attorneys throughout that process. Is that your understanding? That's my understanding, yes, sir. And then once the lacrosse players began hiring attorneys, they essentially stopped talking to the investigators. That would also be my understanding. And you thought or believed that the player's silence was the result of the advice of counsel? I thought that was most likely the case, yes, sir. In fact, on several occasions, you stated this to represent the news media. I believe I said that it was likely on advice of counsel. For example, on March 30th, you said, referring to the players, I think their silence is as a result of advice of counsel. Yes, sir. <clears throat> now, as a prosecutor with 27-plus years of experience, uh, you certainly knew you could not make that kind of a statement in the presence of a jury at trial. It's absolutely true. You, you also made numerous statements to the media beginning in March, uh, on March 27th, describing the specific allegations as to what happened. Yes, sir. I attempted, as I said earlier, to restrict my um, discussion to the facts contained in the non-testimonial order, but I don't know that I was always totally successful in doing that. Um, where would the words absolutely unconscionable appear in the non-testimonial order? They clearly did not, and obviously that I, I also said that some of the statements that I made went over the line. And was totally abhorrent in the non-testimonial order? No, sir, it was not. How about particularly reprehensible? No, sir, it was not. Um, appalling? I don't believe it was, sir. Horrifying? No, sir. Um, you mentioned on direct examination that... Um, you knew from your experience when you saw that non-testimonial order that as a diverse community that uh, racial comments or racial issues could be very divisive or towards that effect. It certainly had the potential for creating, uh, not, not creating divisions or being divisive, but for aggravating some of the divisions that already exist. And I think you said that they, those kinds of comments could really push buttons in the Durham community. Not, I don't think that I was, I said comments. I think those kinds of allegations could push problems. I mean, obviously yeah. the comments could too. And but they, they might, I think you, the words you use, they might be more weighty. I'm not sure. If you say so, I don't recall specifically. Okay. And they would be especially weighty coming from the district attorney in that county, wouldn't you think? I'm not sure what you mean by weighty. I and mean, what, what are you referring to as weighty, well, they, if, they're gonna, if statements like that are likely to push buttons, wouldn't they be likely, more likely to push buttons if they were coming from the district attorney in that county? That's obviously a possibility. And in your pretrial statements, you described uh, these allegations as gang-like rape activity accompanied by racial slurs and general racial hostility. Are you saying that? I did say and that. And that the... Uh, the Assault had a deep racial motivation. Yes, sir, I said that. And Mr. Mantor, could you turn up the volume just a little I'm bit? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're kind of on the edge about being able to hear you. A little bit louder. Yes, sir. And, Mr. Nifong, the reason that you made these statements concerning the silence of the players and the statements about the specific allegations as to what happened was to put pressure on the players to come forward and talk to you, correct? Yes, sir, that was my intention, or my so, hope. 
So you were making statements to the press that you knew you couldn't make to a jury, correct? Yes, sir. I've conceded that. And you were making these statements concerning the player's right to silence, correct? Well, I don't know that I was making any statements specifically about the right to silence. I certainly did not think that they did not have the right to silence. What I was hoping was that there would be someone whose conscience would be persuaded to come forward and give information that would outweigh the feeling that they had just a right to silence. They obviously had that right. You obviously were making comments about their silence. Yes, sir. And that silence, you believe, they were exercising on the advice of their counsel. I thought that was the most likely reason. And, in effect, you were trying to put pressure on them to overcome their silence on the advice of their counsel. Well, certainly it was my hope that after hearing these comments, if there were people that had information that would help us in the investigation, they would come forward. On the morning of March 27th, you directed your assistant, Sheila Eason, or maybe at the time it was your investigator. Is that right? She was in the investigator slot in the office. She was actually in an administrative assistant kind of role, but her official position was she was in the investigator slot. She was not an investigator. And you directed her on the 27th of March to request more information from the Duke Police Department. I don't recall the exact date, but I do recall asking her to get information from the Duke Police Department in that time frame. Okay. Can you look at Exhibit 10 for me, please, the notebook? Yes, sir. Do you recognize that as an email that Ms. Eason sent at your direction on March 27th, 2006? That's what it appears to be, yes, sir. And in that, you're asking for the observations of the victim, whether any or she's asking on your behalf whether anyone was with her or brought her to the emergency room and any statements she made to law enforcement officers, correct? Yes, sir. And you say, she says, all details, even though they may seem insignificant, may add together to help us with this case. Yes, sir. And that was consistent with your directions to her to get information about the investigation of the Duke Cross case? Yes, sir. And so you believed all the details, even if they seemed insignificant, were important to this case? Yes, sir. Those important details would include the observations of the law enforcement officers handling the initial investigation? Yes, sir. And they would include the statements of a person who was with the accuser at the location when she was assaulted? Yes, sir. And they would include, those important details would include the results of testing on evidence? Yes, sir. Within a few hours of this message being sent, you began making statements to the media on March 27th, correct? I think that's probably correct, yes, sir. Sometime, it probably was within three hours, maybe within less than three hours. And before beginning to make those numerous statements to the media on March 27th, you never read the report to the initial investigating officers? I had not read them at that time, no, sir, not all of them, certainly. And you now know that those reports contain significant inconsistencies in Ms. Mangum's statements about whether she was raped and by how many individuals? I do know that they contain those reports, yes, sir. And all three of the investigating officers specifically noted in their reports that she had changed her story repeatedly? Yes, sir, I did note that. But you hadn't read those important details before beginning to make your statements? I had not read those reports, no, sir. Before beginning to make those statements on March 27th, you had not interviewed the other dancer present with Ms. Mangum as pit, correct? I had not, no, sir. And you also had not received any written report back on any of the physical evidence being tested? That's correct. You had not even personally spoken with the alleged victim, Ms. Mangum, before making any statements? I had not. And even without all those important details, you repeatedly gave your opinion 
that the rape or assault had, in fact, occurred, correct? I did, and I conceded that that was something I shouldn't have done. And I think you said this morning that when you met with Mr. Ekstrom on March 28th, you told him that you directed him to the police because you said you didn't know enough to even ask the players questions. Yes, sir, I believe that's correct. I was not the investigator. And on that same day, March 28th, you stated to a representative of the news media that you were convinced that a rape occurred, correct? Yes, sir. And the following day, you stated to a representative of the news media that there's no doubt in your mind that she was raped and assaulted at this location. I did say that. And the following day, on March 30th, you said there's no doubt, there's no doubt a sexual assault took place. Yes, sir, I did. And that statement actually goes beyond your personal opinion and talks about a conclusion that it actually occurred, correct? Yes, sir, although I would say that the ones about my opinion were also unacceptable. Now, you mentioned here that the vast majority of your comments stopped after April 3rd. I think you said 98% of your, roughly 98% of your comments you say happened before April 3rd. Yes, sir, I believe that I said that. But your comments didn't, in fact, to the media, didn't, in fact, stop on that day, did they? Not completely, no, sir. And on May 3rd, 2006, the day after you won the primary election, you stated that you were confident a sexual assault took place. Do you recall that? Not specifically, but I don't doubt it. Tim, would you be willing to accept that it's stipulation 43 in this case? Yes, sir, I would. All right. And on May 3rd, when you expressed your opinion of confidence that a sexual assault took place, two of the cross players had already been indicted. Yes, sir, that's correct. And you stated on that May 3rd interview, quote, if I didn't believe her, then I would have not been basing any of my decisions on what she said. Do you recall that? I did say that, yes, sir. But even by May 3rd, you had not spoken with Ms. Mangum about the allegations. I had not personally spoken with her, that's correct, sir. And yet you were representing to the media and to the public that you were confident that a sexual assault took place because you believed the alleged victim with whom you had never spoken. I believe that, yes, sir, I've made that statement, and my belief is based on the statements of the people who had spoken with her. And, Mr. Nifong, in all the statements to the news media to which you have agreed to have made in this case, you never once used the word alleged concerning the allegations, did you? I don't know if that's the case or not. I mean, if you have them all there, I can't believe that I never used that word alleged at any time, but it may very well be that it's not contained in any of the allegations that are involved here. I'm willing to accept your representation that it's not. At your, you held a press conference on about July 28th of last year, recall that? Yes, sir. And that had to do with the election for the district attorney's office? Yes, sir, it did. And you made a statement to the effect that the media didn't even want to speak with you before the Duke Cross case came along. Do you recall that, something to that effect? Not specifically, but if it's in my statement, then, I mean, I... You don't deny that it's there? I don't deny it if you have it in my statement. I don't recall all the words in that statement, but if you say it's there, then I accept that. All right. And at the North Carolina Central Forum on April 11th about this case, you made a similar comment that the press didn't even know who you were before this case came along. Again, I don't have any recollection of that, but if you say that I made that statement, I'm not going to deny it. Now, you mentioned in your direct examination that the Durham DA's office had prosecuted a murder charge against Michael Peterson a few years back. Yes, sir. And the Peterson trial was a lengthy trial. It was a very lengthy trial, yes, sir. And it received significant media attention? It certainly did. Including being televised? Yes, sir. And Ms. Freda Black was involved in the Michael Peterson trial, correct? She was. And Ms. Black had some significant prior media exposure because of the Peterson case? Yes, she did. And she was one of your two opponents in the campaign for district attorney during the primary? Yes, she was. And you said here on direct that you knew as soon as you saw the NTO that the 
This case was likely to garner significant media attention, correct? Yes, sir, it did. And you saw that order late in the afternoon of March 23rd? Yes, sir. And by the next day, which was a Friday, you had decided to take over the prosecution of this case? Yes, sir. And this was something that normally would have been handled by somebody else in your office as an adult sexual assault case? Yes, Tracy Klein, although she was going to help me with this case. You contacted the Durham Police Department the following day to let them know you were going to be handling the case? On the 24th, yes, sir. And on the next business day, Monday, March 27th, you had the meeting with the initial officers? Yes, sir. And almost immediately thereafter, you began making numerous statements to the press? Yes, sir. As I indicated, we knew that the NTO would be returned on that Monday morning, and the press would likely find it on that day, which is one reason I wanted to speak with the officers that morning. Now, you said that on your calendar that you keep, you generally write down any appointments that you've made in advance on that calendar? Yes, sir. In advance might mean, you know, I might write down something that's going to happen six weeks from now on my calendar, so if somebody asks if I'm going to be doing something, I'll know that. But it also means that if somebody calls from the front desk and says, somebody needs to see you this morning, can you see them a little later? I say, well, yeah, I'll see them at 11. I might write that down. So it could be something that's going to happen fairly soon, or it could be something that's going to happen sometime down the road, just to let me know that I have something scheduled for that time. Can you look at Exhibit 16 in the notebook, please? Tell me if that's your calendar. It's a portion of it, yes, sir. And would you take a look at the third page that's marked there on the bottom? March 27th, 29th. That's it? Yes, sir. And so the initial briefing there would have been sometime between 10 and 12 that morning, correct? Yes, sir, and I believe that's the case. And then beginning at 1245, you have appointments written down here for a reporter for the News and Observer? Yes, sir. And then the next one, next slot right after that for somebody from the Herald Sun? Yes, sir. And then WRAL? Yes, sir. And then WNCN? Yes, sir. And WTVD? Yes, sir. And then the next day, you begin more interviews. You have Kevin Miller with WPTF. You see that? Yes, sir. 7 o'clock the next morning? Yes, sir. And then it looks like interviews with four of the same people, local people that you had spoken with the last day, I'm assuming from the names. Yes, sir. It looks like I saw them all at the same time. All right. They had a joint interview, is what that looks like. And then you had a meeting with Bob Ekstrom that you mentioned before, correct? Yes, sir. And then you spoke with MSNBC, Rita Crosby? Yes, sir. And then you continue to talk to some of the national news there. Eric Lillington from Fox News, you see that? Lilligren, yes, sir. Yeah, and CNN and Good Morning America and O'Reilly Factor. Yes, sir, although the Good Morning America, I mean, I didn't actually appear on that show. Some people from Good Morning America made an appointment to come and talk to me, and they appeared in my office at 5 o'clock. I never actually appeared on the show, but they did come to talk to me about it. And what we did, because we were getting so many interviews, was I asked, I believe Sheila Eason did most of it, but I asked her to do the scheduling so that she would actually set up the times and just call me and let me know we've got these people lined up and I'd write the times in so I'd know who I was doing when. And you continued doing those interviews in the following days with other national news organizations such as ESPN, Dan Abrams, and then some local and statewide News 14, Charlotte Observer. Those are all on your calendar. Yes, sir. You see those? Yes, sir. And those, of course, are just the media that you made in advance because they're the ones written down. Yes, sir, and that's why, although I made the decision on April the 31st not to make any more appointments, by that time there were some appointments already made for Monday morning, and I did honor those appointments that had already been made. And there were other interviews with the media that don't even appear on your calendar. That's also true, sir. You were in the middle of a hotly contested primary election at that time, were you not? Yes, sir. Can you take a look at Exhibit 20, please? Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. You recognize that as a uh, poll from the uh, Fred Black campaign? I recognize this as a document that you showed me at my deposition that I'd never seen before. It does state that it's a poll from the Fred Black campaign, but obviously it was not something that would have been shared with me during the campaign. Okay. And it shows that um, Ms. Black, uh, according to this poll, uh, has 37% of the vote and that you have 20% of the vote at that time. You see that on the bot on the yeah, right yes, sir. Side. I see where I'm just I'm trying to line up these. Yes, sir. That does appear to say it says, that. If the primary election for district attorney was held today, for whom would you vote? Yes, sir. And 37% uh, of the people in Durham that were polled said Miss Black, and 20% said you. Yes, sir. And in a three-way, Mr. Bishop was also in that race at that point, correct? Yes, sir. And in a three-way race in a primary, uh, you only need 40% to win the election. Yes, sir. So Ms. Black, according to this poll, was only three points away from having a number of votes she needed to win the primary, correct? According to the poll, that's correct. But I would point out that the, the poll said that uh, at this point, Mr. Bishop only had 3% of the vote. Mr. Bishop was an African-American candidate and could be expected if he got the endorsement of the Committee on the Affairs of Black People in Durham uh, to get significantly more than 3% than of the vote. Um, and I'd also point out that uh, in Durham, the traditional wisdom has been that elections are won by people who get endorsements from committees. Uh, there are three major committees and some smaller ones, but the, the main groups that endorse in Durham are the Friends of Durham, which is a moderate to conservative group, the Durham People's Alliance, which is a moderate to liberal group, and the previously mentioned uh, Committee on the Affairs of Black People, which is an African American group. There are also, although the, the Herald Sun does not do endorsements, and the News and Observer, I believe, doesn't do them in primaries, uh, the Independent Weekly, which is a uh, local newspaper, does do endorsements. Uh, Fraternal Order of Police does endorsements, Police Benevolent Association. And the general wisdom in Durham has been that if you get any two of the main three uh, groups that I mentioned, the, the People's Alliance, the Friends of Durham, Committee on the Affairs of Black People, that you'll have enough votes as a result of those endorsements to win an election. And was, that was a yes to that Ms. Black only needed three percentage points to uh, win the primary election, according to this poll. Is that right? What I would say, yes, sir, that's correct. But I'd also say that the poll is not a very realistic picture of the situation in Durham in terms of elections. And that poll was taken, uh, according to this document, on March 27, 2006, correct? Yes, sir. And that is the precise day that you began making statements to the media in the Duke Cross cases, correct? Yes, sir, it is. It's also well before the time that any of these committees do their endorsements. All right. <clears throat> now, when you became the district attorney, you almost immediately fired Freda Black. Is that correct? Well, that's, that is a personnel matter. Officially, Ms. Black resigned. Um, you, you took over the office, and the next day, Ms. Black did not have a job. Is that correct? She was no longer employed in the Durham District Attorney's Office the she day was, after you took an office. She office. was officially employed in the Durham District Attorney's Office until the end of the month of May. She was paid to the end of the month of May. She did not come to work after the um, Friday following my appointment. Mr. Knopfong, I believe you're going to yeah. have to speak I'm, up. I'm sorry. Mr. Alexander has I'm sorry. seen you when you lean back too far. I'm sorry. That's fine. And so shortly after you took office, Ms. Black was no longer in the Durham District Attorney's Office, correct? It is correct that she was no longer in the office. And that was your decision? Yes, sir. And you have worked in the Durham District Attorney's Office for 28 years. Roughly 28 years. Uh, a little longer than that. Uh, um, 28 and uh, 28 years and seven or eight months. 28 plus years. Yes, sir. And that's the only place you have ever worked as an attorney, correct? Yes, sir. <clears throat> and you knew if Miss Black prevailed in the primary election, you wouldn't have a job after after the election was over, correct? 
well, in the Durham District Attorney's Office. I knew that if Ms. Platt prevailed in that, in that election, I wouldn't want a job in the District Attorney's Office. And so if you lost the primary, you essentially would have been out of the only job in which you had had an office as an attorney, correct? Yes, sir. That's going to be happening after this hearing anyway, but yes, sir. And during the election, um, you and your wife loaned a significant amount of money to your campaign. I don't know how to answer that precisely. I loaned $5,000 specifically to my campaign. I wrote a check uh, to my campaign um, and delivered that to my uh, campaign treasurer, Ed Palumbo. My wife, her loans, as they are called, had to do with the fact that when we had expenses like having signs done and paying for advertising, she put them on a credit card, her credit card, um, and they, those expenses were charged to the credit card, and then she gave the receipts to the treasurer, and he repaid her the receipts from the, the money that was raised by the campaign. So technically it's listed as a loan, but it's not a loan in the sense that I give you $10,000 and hope that you pay it back. Mine was a loan like that, which, by the way, I didn't get back. But hers were just use of the credit card that she did get reimbursement for, for the most part. And you're aware that as a uh, candidate for public office, uh, you have to file disclosure reports of your campaign finances. Yes, sir, that's true. And um, if you'll look at Exhibit 18, please. I don't, I don't seem to have an exhibit 18 here. I have a, a Based on relevant divider, but I don't have a... Hold on. Hold on. I don't have an exhibit 18 either. I believe these were some of the ones we said weren't going to be in here. They haven't been admitted yet. I mean, oh, this oh. is cross-examination, so they haven't been... We haven't offered them an evidence yet. Well, no, I don't have an exhibit 18 in my book. Yeah, it's, it's not, because that was objected to oh, okay. originally, and I'm objecting again based upon the grounds of, of relevance. To the issues that are before the State Bar Committee related to um, intentional misconduct related to the handlings of the DNA and all that other stuff that is out there. I went over on my motion for a directed verdict. I don't see how it's relevant. Uh, I, I think I got to see it to, to rule on whether it's relevant. We're getting it. What? Okay. Sorry. You want to move on to something else? Yes. While we do that? That. Now, in your testimony beginning uh, the hearing this morning, <clears throat> you said that at the initial investigation that the only people who had been implicated were Duke Cross players, correct? I said that the information we got from the players was that all the people at the party were Duke Cross players, if that's what you're referring to. And that was the basis for saying that the universe of people who uh, could have been involved were Duke Cross players? The universe that we were aware of at the time. And you were aware um, that the players had made statements listing out the people? Yes, sir. I, I was aware that each player listed uh, made a list of people that not all the lists contained the same people, and that there were some people that were not on any list. Yes, sir. And you said uh, this morning that you had those statements. Uh, they had been provided to you by the police officers, correct? They had them when they came to talk to me about them, yes, sir. And would you look at Exhibit uh, 12A, please? Yes, sir. Do you recognize uh, that is the voluntary uh, written statement from David Evans? 12A? I'm sorry. My 12A 12, seems to be Matthew Zaz. Yeah, I apologize. 12B. You see that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, can you flip to the uh, last two pages, please? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that was a statement that Mr. Evans gave on the night of the 16th or the morning of the 17th after the search warrant, correct? Yes, sir. And he lists out on the last two pages, these are the people I know were at the party on March 13th, 2006. You see that statement? Yes, sir, I do. And then if you go about a third of the way down, he lists a uh, gentleman. I won't uh, call out his name, but he, he writes in parentheses their neighbor. Yes, sir, he does. And... 
Then if you go over to the second page, on the very top, there's another person there that says neighbor, correct? Yes, sir, it does. And then uh, he's got uh, another person about a half of the way down who's listed as a, as a neighbor. You see that? Yes, sir. And then he, right beside that, he's put uh, plus two, three fraternity guys, and then he has a name there, Blake. And Blake was one of the people that was identified. Yes, sir. We, right. Yes, sir. Yes. So from the very beginning of the investigation, uh, you knew that not all the people at that party were due to cross players, correct? Well, the officers told me that they believed that not all the people at the uh, party were the cross players. Uh, I don't know that they specifically pointed out these names on the list, but... Um, I mean, I certainly was aware that there was a suspicion that there were more people than Duke Cross players here, yes, sir. Well, you said this morning that you actually got the statements. I did get the statements. Okay. So, and these were in the statements? They were in the statements. So you would have known that there were people other than Duke Cross players at the party from the very beginning when you got involved? If I had carefully read the statements and had remembered all those na- uh, the, the designations, I would have, sir, yes, sir. So you didn't, you didn't read the statements? I don't. I don't believe that's correct. I believe that I did read the statements, but I obviously either did not recall or did not notice that were people other than the cross players listed. So the statement this morning was that was not accurate, correct? All the all the people initially were not identified as the cross players. To the extent that I made that statement, that would not be correct according to this, yes, sir. And you talked about the photographic procedure that you. Uh, directed the police to to con- conduct on March 31st. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. <clears throat> and you said in your testimony that you didn't think that any of the Duke and Cross players were suspects. Is that correct? No, sir. I didn't say that I didn't think any of them were suspects. I said I didn't know who the suspects were. I, I said that we had a list of people that were supposedly in the house when this took place and that other than that, I did not have a, a suspicion against any person. So you had no suspicion against any of the people in, on the lacrosse team, the Caucasian? No, no specific suspicion, no, sir. Not, I, I couldn't look at one and say, I suspect this guy or this guy or this guy. And they were all people who were members of the lacrosse team, were supposedly at the party, but I could not, I had no suspicion about any one of them specifically. Now, to get a non-testimonial order, um, can you get that on anybody? Or do you have to have some basis to get a non-testimonial order? You have to have reasonable suspicion. And you have to actually have to have reasonable cause to believe or suspect to believe that somebody actually committed a crime, correct? Yes, sir, that someone committed a crime. And if you look at Exhibit 203 in this case, the non-testimonial order that was entered in this case... See that? Yes, sir. And that was uh, signed, uh, prepared by the lead investigators on this case, but signed by David Sachs in your office. Yes, right? sir. And he's the he's the uh, chief assistant for you. Yes, sir. He is. And the very first page of that caption um, under application for non-testimonial order, it, there's a parenthesis there that says "adult suspect." Yes, sir. So this application from your office is identifying whoever's in this order as a suspect, correct? Well, you could argue that, but if you look at page 3, um, it says name and, and description of subjects, not suspects, but subjects of the order. So, so you're saying that this caption that says suspect doesn't really mean suspect? Well, no, I think obviously that, that when you're asking for a non testimony order, it's because you think that it might give you information that helps you determine who's involved in the case, who's, who's committed a particular crime. But as I indicated previously, I have never seen a non testimony order that listed 46 people on it. And the name and description is not of, su- of suspects, but of subjects. I think this is a very unusual non testimony proceeding. Did you disagree with the order? Did you disagree with the application in the order that was obtained? Well, it was, there, already, they, it was already done by the time I did it, uh, by the time I saw it. It had already been executed and served and all, but I don't know what you mean that I disagree with it. I, I think I previously testified that there was some language that I might not have included. Well, 
you have to have reasonable grounds to suspect that somebody committed a crime to get this application, to get an order, don't you? Yes, sir. And are you saying that there wasn't reasonable grounds to suspect that these 46 lacrosse players committed this crime? There was certainly not reasonable grounds to believe that 46 lacrosse players committed a crime. There were reasonable grounds to suspect that someone among those 46 lacrosse players could have committed a crime. But nobody ever suggested that 46 people committed a crime. Did you disagree, then, with getting the order against all 46 people? Did you think that was inappropriate or ill-advised? I thought it was unusual, but as I indicated, this was an accomplished fact by the time that I ever entered the case. I discovered, I found out about the case by discovering a copy of this order. And where did the photographs come from that were used during this photo identification procedure? The one that took place on April the 4th? Yes. They were obtained from this non-testimonial order. So you didn't necessarily agree with this, but you were willing to use the photographs that were obtained under it in the photograph procedure. Is that right? Mr. Crocker, I don't know how to intelligently answer that question. I've tried to explain that the order is not the order, perhaps, that I would have drawn up in exactly the way I would have drawn it up, but it was a done deal by the time that I got into the case. So there was nothing that struck me about the order as improper, and had the order been felt to be improper by somebody, I'm sure there would have been some kind of motion for hearing to have it disallowed, to suppress, or to, I think there's even provision for that. But the photographic procedure wasn't done by the time you got involved, was it? The procedure had not been done, no, sir. So if you disagreed with the order and didn't think these people were suspects, you didn't have any obligation to use the photographs that were obtained under it in a photographic procedure, did you? Or, for that matter, an obligation to use the group of swabs for DNA testing, but we had the evidence and we were trying to find out what happened in the case, and so I used the evidence that I had. Now, one of the positions that you've taken in this case with respect to the pretrial statements is that initially you didn't think they were improper because there were no suspects. That was something that entered into my thinking as I was going through this. I mean, that if there are no suspects, then how can you be talking about something that is going to prejudice a suspect if no suspects exist yet? Yes, sir, that was part of my thinking. And in your initial response to the letter of notice and with respect to the pretrial statements, that was one of the grounds on which you said that none of the pretrial statements that you had made were violations of the rules. That is correct. And when you respond in the answer in this hearing commission, that was, again, asserted as the basis for why those statements didn't violate the rules of professional conduct. Yes, sir, it was. And, in fact, even on the first day of your deposition, you testified that you didn't think that those violated the rules of professional conduct. Yes, sir, I did. Now, by April 4th, Ms. Mangum, let me ask you, under your definition of a suspect, at least by the time somebody is identified in procedure, photographically or some other way, they're a suspect, at least by then. Yes, sir. And on April 12th, you sought and obtained an order to seal the indictments against Reed Seligman and Colin Fairman. I don't recall the date, but that sounds right. I'm sure you have it there. And so by that date, you had decided to seek an indictment against those two individuals. Yes, sir. Certainly they were suspects at that point, correct? Yes, sir. And you also have contended that your extrajudicial statements to the press, in this case, had nothing to do with your race or district attorney. I was attempting to keep the case from becoming embroiled any more than it had to in the race for district attorney. 
And at the candidates forum that we watched that you mentioned before, which of course was for the district attorney's race, you got up and said, I'm not going to let Durham's view in the minds of the world be a bunch of lacrosse players from Duke raping a black girl. Correct? Yes, sir. I've conceded that was an improper statement. And that was the day after you obtained indictments against these, or motion to seal the indictment against these two players. Yes, sir. Now, the, Mr. Witt asked you a question about the statement that Investigator Hyman testified about in this hearing that he testified was at the initial briefing. Yes, sir. And making the comment there up on the board on the 27th. Yes, sir. And you were asked about that today and you said that you believe that was made on March 30th, later that week. I said I did not know exactly what date that it was made. If I were asked to guess a date, that would be my best guess, but I don't know the specific date. Do you have a specific recollection of making that statement? Something similar to that. My recollection is that it was more, this is where or this is how we're effed. Can you look at that deposition again, please? Yes, sir. What page? Page 49. The bottom of that, I asked you a question about that. I said I'm going to have to use this language because it's exact. But do you remember making a comment in the meeting, and I'm talking about the initial briefing there, to the effect in talking about this case and what happened up to this point, I think the exact quote was we're fucked. And your response was no, sir. You see that? Yes, sir, I see that. And then you go on to talk about how you're not going to deny that you made the statement, but you have no recollection of making that statement. And then I go on to say that my recollection is that statement would have been made at a later time and in reference to some things that had been written by, had been put in a report by another officer, some things that had been stated by another officer, specifically Officer Shelton, who was the first officer to arrive at the scene of the crime, who did not believe that anything had occurred other than it was a drunk victim, et cetera. And at that point in time, you said that you didn't think that statement, if it happened at all, happened until much later, much later, the following week, correct? Well, I don't know that I said anything about a specific time later. I said later. Okay. I'm just looking for the, was made at a later time. My recollection is that that statement would have been made at a later time and in reference to some things that had been written by another officer. I want to ask you a little bit about the, discovery in this case. You testified in, about the May 12th hearing, the May 12th meeting with Dr. Meehan. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. And you said that Dr. Meehan went through the report with you at that May 12th meeting. Do you recall that? I think he probably did. Yes, sir. And do you recall me asking those questions at your deposition about whether or not you had gone, in fact, gone through the report on that May 12th meeting? Not specifically, but I'm sure that you'll show me that you did. Please turn to page 316 of your deposition. I don't believe I have that volume of the deposition. This seems to go up to 279. Thank you. I have page 316, sir. And starting on page 17 there, I ask you, and did you have... Page 17 or 317? I'm sorry, page 316, line 17. Okay, line 17. Thank you. 
And did you have, at that May 12th meeting, did you remember asking any questions about any of, the type of inf any of that type of information? Do you see that? Yes, sir. Uh, not specifically, but I do seem to recall, and it would have presumably been at this meeting that I left with the understanding that it was a level of certainty that was 98%. You're talking about Dave Evans? Yes, sir. Match right yes, there. sir. And I said, besides those three results, the matches that appear in court, did you discuss any other results of the test? And you say, not that I recall. Yes, sir. Any discussion about what was, did he actually, did Dr. Meehan actually go through the report with you? And your answer was, no, sir. We had, we had the discussion about this finding. He handed us a copy, or actually I think maybe two or three copies of the report, but we didn't actually go over the report itself. Do you see that? Yes, sir, I do. And did you have any discussions at that meeting? Uh, did any discussions occur at that meeting about what was included in the report? And you say, not that I recall. Yes, sir. Any discussion about what, if anything, was included in the report? Not that I recall. Yes, sir, I see that. That's directly contradictory to your testimony today. There's a, Mr. Rancom? Yes, sir. It appears to be at least somewhat contradictory. Okay. So which one of those is the true statement? Each of them is a true statement, as I recall, at the time that the statement was made. And that was less than a month ago? Yes, sir. And that was prior to Dr. Meehan's testimony here in this hearing? Yes, sir, it was. Now, you talked about, you said that you now acknowledge that you um, admit that discovery was not provided that should have been provided. I don't know that I've ever denied that. You haven't? I don't know that I have. I mean, I have said that I never intentionally, um, you know, left out anything, but I have denied, I have, I have admitted that the discovery wasn't given, but it wasn't with him. Maybe I misunderstood your question. Well, we came up for a hearing uh, earlier in this case in which you asked the Disciplinary Hearing Commission to dismiss the violations uh, relating to disclosure and discovery, saying that there was nothing, there was no violation. All that? Objection. Objection. He's asking questions about legal arguments that counsel made. I'm sorry. I was talking to the attorney. Oh, read that back to the floor. He's going into questions about arguments that were made at the motion to dismiss, that are arguments of counsel that were made in the case, um, and, and asking those, going into those questions. Where it wasn't an admission or a denial of anything in the complaint. It was matters that were raised by counsel to test the legal su sufficiency of a matter that was out there in the initial phase of the case. And he's asking him that as a contradictory statement to some statement of fact that he made. Ms. Wolf, did you get that last question? I didn't hear the sustain an objection. Uh, I, I will sustain that objection. Thank you. you. Your testimony here today is that you didn't know that the unidentified male DNA was not included in the May 12th report because you have never read the report. You never read the report between May 12th when you received it and December 13th, correct? I never read the report between May the 12th. I don't know to what extent I read it on May the 12th. I never read it between May the 12th and December the 13th. Yes, sir, that's correct. And the issue of your discussions with Dr. Meehan and the test results um, came up on numerous subsequent occasions in that case, did they not? There were certainly questions that were asked, although some of them I think were about the facts, of the, whether to discuss the facts of the case with him or something like that. Um, I, 
But yes, the, the issue did come up on two occasions. It came up at a hearing on May 18th. Yes, so that was the first time. It came up again on a hearing on June 22nd. If you say so. And it came up again on a hearing on September 22nd. Again, if that's, if that's what it shows, then that's, I don't, I don't dispute that. <clears throat> well, let's look specifically then. All right. <clears throat> at each one of, do you recall, at each one of those, uh, before each one of those hearings, you were served with a specific discovery request asking about DNA security and conversations that you had with Dr. Meehan. Mm -hmm. um, I don't recall that specifically, but the, if that's in here, then I, I, I would... It may very well be true. I just don't know that I recall that I was specifically served with something part of each of those here. All right. Look at Exhibit 218 in the notebook. <laughs> yes, sir. This appears to have been filed after the May 18th year. No, I'm sorry. Yes, May 26th. This was filed after that hearing. I'm sorry, if you look at Exhibit 212. Come on. So that is a motion from Kirk Osborne. Yes, sir. And um, that was served on you on April 19th, 2006, right? It's Last page. Signed on April 19th. I can't really see the... Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And this is a discovery request from Mr. Seligman's attorney? Yes, sir, it is. And if you look at page 2, you see that? Yes, sir, I see page 2. Paragraph 6. Yes, sir. And it asks specifically for uh, test results, including but not limited to DNA analysis. Yes, sir, it does. And then if you go over on the next page in paragraph 16, it specifically asks for uh, pursuance of Brady and other uh, reports, exculpatory inf type information. Yes, sir. And this... You received this discovery motion either shortly before or right around the time of your second meeting with Dr. Meehan, correct? On April 21st. Um, assuming, as I said earlier, that that was in fact the second meeting, which I believe it most likely was, that would be correct, sir. And that was the meeting at which Dr. Meehan told you about the unidentified male DNA that not, did not match any of the cross players. I don't believe that's the case. My recollection is that that was something that was done at the, at the first meeting I had with him. And that's one of the things that I referred to. In my answer, when I said I only recalled having made two meetings, and for having had two meetings with Dr. Meehan. And so in my answer, I talked about what happened at the first meeting and the second meeting in the belief that there had been two. I now think it's likely that there were, in fact, three meetings. Um, but I, I cannot distinguish between exactly what happened at each meeting. But I, I do believe that that conversation took place prior to the fingernails having been delivered to the lab. Having seen, and, and that would have made it occur at the April 10th meeting, which would have been the actual first meeting if I had three. But the April 21st meeting would have been the first meeting if I had two, and that's why I refer to that the way I do in my answer. Okay. Excuse me, Mr. Brock, let me yes. just ask one question because this occurred to me before. If this helps uh, refresh your recollection, Mr. Nifong, do you recall whether you met with Dr. Meehan prior to the indictments of Mr. Finnerty and Seligman? No, sir, I really don't. I don't. I don't specifically recall that. You don't recall one way or the other. No, sir, I don't. I wish I did, but I, I just don't. All right. I, I, I believe that with everybody testifying that there were three meetings, I believe there must have been three. I just don't have any specific recollection of that meeting. I'm not denying that it took place or that I was there. I just can't specifically recall it. 
Okay. All right. Continue, Mr. Brown. Prior to hearing the testimony here at this hearing, though, you have consistently said you were not at the April 10th meeting. I believe that my first response said that there were two meetings, and my second response or my follow-up response acknowledged that I was aware that other people said there were three meetings, but that I could only recall two. Okay. Yes, sir, that's correct. And in your grievance response, the initial one, you set forth how all these matters about the unidentified DNA were discussed at the April 21st meeting. Yes, sir, because that, I believe, would be the first meeting we had. Those were discussed at the first meeting that I had with Dr. Meehan. So you're now saying that you think that they were, in fact, discussed. You found out about this unidentified male DNA not matching any of the lacrosse players before anybody was indicted. I believe that I found out about it at the first meeting. Assuming the first meeting did, in fact, take place on April 10th, that would be correct. Yes, sir, I believe that's correct. So by the time you had gotten this April 19th response that we were just looking at, you had already been told specifically that there was unidentified male DNA not matching the players. Yes, sir, I believe that was likely the case. Okay. And this request specifically asked for exculpatory information and DNA results. There's no question it did. I have said all along they were entitled to that information. I haven't changed my mind on that. And within a few days after that, you got another request from Mr. Seligman also asking for DNA results and exculpatory information. Probably. I don't recall the list. Let's look at 215A, please. Yes, sir, I see that. And if you look at page 2, that is dated April 28th, 2006. Actually, in any case, it was served to me on the 26th. It was filed on the 28th. All right. So you got this on April 26th. It would appear, yes, sir. And if you go on page 2, that specifically asked for materials under Brady and specifically 3.8 of the North Carolina Rules of Professional Conduct. See that? I'm sorry, sir. Paragraph 4, page 2. Yes, sir. And that asked for information you see under Brady and Rule 3.8 of the North Carolina Rules of Professional Conduct, including but limited to evidence tending to negate the defendant's guilt. Yes, sir. And certainly by that point, you had received information from Dr. Meehan discussing these or disclosing the results of these tests that had unidentified male DNA. There's no question, sir. And that would have been within about four or five days of the second meeting you had with Dr. Meehan on the 21st. Yes, sir. That's when this would have been served. Yes, sir. And so you were receiving these discovery requests asking for exculpatory information and information covered by 3.8 contemporaneously with when you were meeting with Dr. Meehan and finding out about these unidentified male DNA that didn't match any of the cross players, correct? Well, yes, sir, that's true. But my response to discovery requests is not to go through and read the discovery request line by line because it's going to be a boilerplate motion that they're going to ask for stuff. What I'm going to give them is everything I have. If I don't have everything they want, they'll let me know and I'll give them that stuff, too. So that's what I did. You didn't you didn't have to read these to know that you were required to give exculpatory. Absolutely not. I've always known that. I've made it clear that I knew that and that I conceded that even if it were not exculpatory information, they still were entitled to it. Whether however you consider it, they're entitled to it. And would you agree with Ms. Gooden now that you're required to give that information immediately upon receipt? I don't know that I would necessarily agree with that because, you know, I don't know that I agree with everything that Ms. Gooden now said, but I clearly agree that they should have gotten that information. You don't think you're required to give exculpatory information to the defense immediately? Well, I believe that she said that she said it in that context. But what you know, what I try to do is if you have something, a complicated report, something like DNA, then 
it's usually, usually a little easier to, to give the report than to try to figure out exactly what's said and do that. So I would say that whether it's right or wrong, I wait for the report. And when you provided discovery uh, on May 18th with your written discovery responses, um, you were aware of all that information. You were aware of the DNA being out there, correct? Uh, it was not in my mind, but it was something I had been made aware of, yes, sir. And the discovery was provided in connection with a hearing on uh, May 18th? Yes, sir. And that was the hearing at which you said that you provided uh, all information that you had? Yes, sir. And putting aside your, your intent for the moment, um, that was a false statement of material fact to the court, correct? Well, it was a false statement in the sense that there was information that I believed that I had given that I had not given because I did not know that there was something that I knew that wasn't in that report. And the, the problem is that I did not, I was not aware that that information was not in the report and I was not thinking about that information specifically. So the statement that I made was factually incorrect because I had not given information to them that I had received from Dr. Meehan. But it was not an intentional false representation. I, I asked you to put your intent aside. It, it is, in fact, a false statement of material fact to the court, correct? Yes, sir, it is. Right. <clears throat> and you contend that despite these requests, um, you didn't read the report before making this false statement of material fact to the court on May 18th. Well, yes, sir, that's true. I did not read the report before I made that. I just had turned over everything that I had, and I did not read every document to determine precisely what it contained. And you also provided written discovery responses, uh, which affirmatively represented both to the court and to the defendants that you were not aware of any other exculpatory information which had not been provided, correct? I believe that's correct, sir. And you didn't read the report to confirm that the specific results that had been discussed with you at on at least one, if not more, meetings were actually contained in that report. That's your contention? That is correct, sir. <clears throat> and that subject came up again uh, in discovery respect requests specifically before the next hearing, correct? I don't recall specifically, but it may have. We'll look at Exhibit 218, the first one we went to. Yes, sir. That's a request from Mr. Evans, dated May 26, correct? Yes, sir. And um, as far as I was concerned, I had complied with that request before I'd received it. So you didn't bother to read it? Uh, it's quite possible that I didn't. As I indicated, um, in terms of, of requests for discovery, uh, since we're required to give everything anyway, I, I'm aware of, of that duty, so I probably did not read this. All right, and you're aware of your duty under Rule 3.8 that's specifically noted in page 2 of that report? Yes, sir. And did you read page 10? I can't recall what page 10 is, but let's see. Specifically, on the second bullet point on page 10, the defendants asked for uh, information about the April 10th meeting between you, Detective Hyman, Sergeant Gottlieb, and Brian. I see that it's there. I don't recall, as I indicated, having specifically read this uh, particular um, request because I'd already given everything we had. And, but Mr. Evans' lawyer didn't just serve the request. They actually sent you a letter to put you on specific notice that that issue was going to be addressed at the June 22nd hearing, correct? Um, if you say so, I don't recall specifically the letter. Is that in here, too? Yes, it is. <clears throat> Could you give me another reference? Uh, I'm Take a look at Exhibit 220, please. Yes, 
Yes, sir. And that's a letter to you dated June 19th, which is before the June 22nd hearing, correct? Yes, sir. And on page 2, paragraph 8. Yes, sir. They list the same request, correct? Yes, sir. I actually do recall. I believe this is probably what we went over when we were making our specific response in the courtroom. I think it was probably this letter was the one that we used as a model. Yes, sir. That's right. And they were putting you on notice on June 19th that at that next hearing they wanted to discuss that specific issue. They wanted to know what you had been told on April 10th, 2006, in your meeting with Dr. Meehan. It does say that, yes, sir. And that issue, in fact, came up at the June 22nd hearing, didn't it? Yes, sir, it did. And in that hearing you represented that there was no discussions at all at the April 10th meeting with Dr. Meehan that weren't attorney work product. Do you have a reference for that? Exhibit 222, page 20. I don't know if this is a particular transcript or not, but there was one that I recall in particular where they were asking about a meeting on April 10th, and it was clear that I was answering the meeting about May 12th. Yes, it's this one. Let me ask you if this is what the transcript says, and then I'll ask you a question. Mr. Cheshire, as far as 8-9, 8 is the 8 that we just looked at in that letter, there are similar arguments I would like to make to the court. I understand that Mr. Nifong said about 8, and that is the report of the meeting on April 10th among Mr. Nifong, Investigator Hyman, Sergeant Gottlieb, and Brian Meehan. And as I understand what he says, there was no discussion at all that wasn't attorney work product at that meeting. And your response is, that's pretty much correct, Your Honor. We received the reports, which he has received, and we talked about how we would likely use that, and that's what we did. Correct? That was your response. That was my response, and it seems that the meeting that we received the reports was the May 12th meeting. As I indicated, I did not recall actually having had an April 10th meeting. And so, although I didn't make it clear, I seem to have assumed here that I thought he was referring to the May meeting rather than the April meeting, because I said we received the reports, which he has received. And that clearly did not happen until the May 12th meeting. So I think that I may have misunderstood what was being discussed here, and I gave a response about the May 12th meeting. You had received the May 12th report, correct? I had certainly received it at that point, but what this is referring to, we received the reports, which he has received, and talked about how we would likely use that. We didn't receive any reports until the May 12th meeting. And they were, in fact, asking you about the April 10th meeting, which is the meeting that you now say was the one where you actually got all the unidentified male DNA results from Dr. Meehan, correct? Yes, sir, but when I was referring to the report, I was referring to the written report, which was received on May 12th. I understand that, but the defendants were asking you in court about a meeting on April 10th, which you now say is the meeting at which you got this unidentified male DNA, correct? It appears that's what they were asking about. It does not appear that's what I was answering about. Well, certainly you would agree that the comments you made on June 22nd were misleading, at least, if you're referencing a meeting on May 12th and talking about it being on April 10th. I don't deny that that would have been misleading, sir, but it certainly was not my intent. I obviously misspoke, but my answer makes it clear to me that I was referring to the May 12th meeting. Okay. And you represent that there was nothing to provide that wasn't an attorney work product beyond what was in the report? Yes, sir, that was my representation. And, again, your contention is that you never went back prior to that hearing, despite being on notice, and read the report? Yes, sir, that's true. If I could say something, Mr. Brocker, with respect to that generally. As somebody who, for all my career, has given open file discovery, maybe I take a little bit of a different view towards things. I know that there are people who 
um, read documents and things that they receive looking for reasons not to give them, or they used to be. But I've, I've never looked at it that way. My assumption is that if I get it, I'm going to give it, and I don't make exceptions, and I don't. So, so I'm not looking over stuff maybe as attentively as some people would because I'm just going to automatically be giving what I get. That's just always been my policy, and it may have worked to my disadvantage in this case. Now, but when, when you receive it, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's all right. Yeah, all right. So when you received that May 12th report, um, two of the players had already been indicted, right? Yes, sir, that's true. And you didn't think it was important to go through the report and make sure that the exculpatory information that you had been told was actually in the report? I knew that there was nothing, uh, no inculpatory information regarding either of those two players in the report, and that's probably all I was thinking about in terms of that. But I did not go through the report. So even though these two young men had been indicted, the only thing that you were thinking about was whether it was inculpatory or not, not whether that there was exculpatory information that should be disclosed in this report. Well, in the first place, I think that it is specifically exculpatory to give somebody a report that says we tested all these items from the rape kit and found no DNA from either of these two players or any of the other players on any of these items. I think that is exculpatory. I think that's specifically exculpatory. But um, and that was provided. So it's, it's not, I don't think it's fair to say that I was not trying to give them um, arguably exculpatory information when I gave them specifically exculpatory information. Well, actually, the report itself doesn't say anything specific about the fact that they don't match. You have to imply that, correct? Um, Unlike, for example, the SBI reports, which come out specifically and say we found DNA and it didn't match, this report said nothing about that, correct? I believe that it, in fact, did not say anything about that specifically. Now, this issue came up yet again at the September 22nd hearing, correct? Yes, sir. And again, you were put on notice in advance by the defendants that this issue was going to come up. Um, I don't recall the specific uh, um, motion. I guess that'd be the joint omnibus motion. Would that be the one you're referring to? That's correct. To? And yes, we sir. talked about that earlier. Yes, sir. In the specific request for the meetings of Dr. Meehan in that. Yes, sir. They brought it up again. Yes, sir. And they specifically asked again for exculpatory information. If you look at 223, yes, page sir. 8. Sorry, page 7. Yes, sir. And that's the request for information about the meetings with Dr. Meehan, correct? Yes, sir. And at the very next page, very bottom, they're asking for information of a number of things, and they specifically cite Brady and exculpatory evidence um, in that request. What were you referring to, sir? It's the very last sentence on page 8 of that paragraph. Oh, yes, sir, that paragraph. Yes, sir. And they specifically, again, mentioned exculpatory information. Yes, sir, they did. And those were taken up at the hearing on the 22nd. Uh, yes, sir, they were. And you responded to a uh, question from Judge Smith, and in direct response, you represented that there were no other statements made to you beyond what was in the report of DNA security. I believe that's correct. I don't have the specific reference, but I think that is correct, sir. All right. Well, you can go to 220, exhibit 224, page 28. Sorry. Yes, sir. The transcript is actually 225. <clears throat> Yes, sir. It says, uh, that is correct. The facts of the case, other than the fact that we were seeking a male fraction DNA, the facts of the case weren't discussed in those meetings. Right. And before that, says. before that, uh, going back to page 27, um, the court asked you at the very bottom there on page 24, so his report encompasses it all, correct? Yes, sir. And then 
you give an answer and Judge Smith comes back, line 10, so you represent there are no other statements from Dr. Meehan, and your response is no other statements, no other statements made to me. Yes, sir. And then Mr. Bannon follows that up to make sure it's clear. Just so I'm clear, Mr. Nifong is representing that the facts of this case weren't discussed in those meetings with Dr. Meehan, correct? Yes, sir. And your answer was that's correct. And again, you contend that before making this affirmative misrepresentation to the court, you contend you never went back and read the report to find out whether that potentially exculpatory information was in the report, correct? That is correct, yes, sir. And the court, in fact, relied upon those representations in entering its order denying the defendant's request to get the content of those meetings. I think that's correct, sir. And about a month later, Mr. Bannon sent you an order, which we've already discussed here today, which said precisely what we just talked about, that you had represented that there was nothing else discussed beyond what was in that meeting and that the court relied upon that in denying the request. Do you recall that? I recall discussing the order. I don't recall the specific language of that section of the order, but I don't deny that. And I'm sure if you're asking me that, it must be there. And you would have had yet another opportunity before consent to that order to go back and read the report and see if the information was in there. I certainly would have had the opportunity, yes, sir. I did not take it. And during that hearing, you mentioned in response to the chair's question that you had made a comment about the other information that was requested, the underlying data, that it was a witch hunt, the defendant's witch hunt. Yes, sir, I did. And that witch hunt, in fact, is what led to the discovery of the exculpatory information in this case. Yes, sir. It did. It did lead to that, although they – there was no question that they were entitled to it. As indicated, that wasn't an objection to their asking for it. That was just my way of getting a statement in front of the press that was contrasting some of the public comments that the defense attorneys had made about the strength of the DNA case or the DNA evidence with what they were saying in court. And I've admitted that statement shouldn't have been made. In fact, that statement on September 22nd was a false statement of material fact to the court, correct? A false statement of material fact? A false statement of material fact that you made to the court. I'm not sure that I agree with that. I don't understand. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Which one was – a couple statements he was talking about. Which one was that? Well, I'll clarify. Okay. Do you want – all right. Okay. He's stating material facts to the court. Okay. Which one was that? Okay. 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 Okay.
Which page was that, please? Page 50. Oh, yes, sir. That's what you're saying. All right. And you read in to the court in response to the request for the underlying data for DNA securities, you read in a letter from Dr. Meehan, and specifically on page 51, starting on line 5, it says, in an effort to protect the privacy of these individuals in a very high-profile case, we limited our formal reports to the evidence items and only the persons tested that could be linked to the evidence through the DNA testing results. That's the letter you read to the court on that same hearing, correct? Yes, sir. It does seem to be the case. And later in that hearing, Doug Kingsbury made some comments about that. Did he not? Do you recall that? I recall Mr. Kingsbury making some comments at one of the hearings. I'll take your word for it. All right. And if you go to page 74 of that transcript, please. Yes, sir. And if you look at page 73, you'll see that's Mr. Kingsbury's comment. You see that? Yes, sir, I do. And then if you go back over, starting on line 2 there, Mr. Kingsbury says, and this is my point, we're seeking information of any additional DNA that was found on this alleged victim, even though it doesn't match any of the defendants. And I want to make sure that the state understands our request for discovery is not limited to simply things that have to do with these defendants or the list of individuals that the state provided to the experts. He goes on to say, I bring this up because I believe I heard Mr. Nifon say today that he's got some correspondence or communication from his experts, which limits what's in the reports to the defendants and to those thought to be linked. And if there are additional male DNA present on this victim, I want to make sure that everyone understands that our discovery motion asked for that material as well. That's what Mr. Kingsbury said at that hearing. Yes, sir, he did. And you were present at that hearing. Yes, sir. And the court responded, well, I think it's pretty broadly stated in your request. I understand the state's SBI lab as well as the private lab will comply with that request. It's clear from Mr. Kingsbury's comment that he wasn't aware of any additional male DNA, was he? Well, I'm not sure what all is clear, but he's clearly referring to male DNA. So you're saying that you don't think it's clear from Mr. Kingsbury's comment that he is saying if there's any other male DNA out there, we want it because we don't have it. He is saying that, and the court says it will be included in the report. But what you're asking me is did that statement by Mr. Kingsbury trigger any memory within me of this? And the answer is no, it did not. It didn't trigger a memory or cause you to go back and look at this report to see if, in fact, that this male DNA, this unidentified male DNA that had been discussed with you was, in fact, in this report. No, sir, it didn't. And as the court said, you know, whatever's in there, you're going to get. I didn't think about it again. No, sir. Yes. I want to take a break here, and I should have. I think I discussed with counsel that we would go later this evening, and I intend to do that. But I think it's appropriate here to take a break and come back at 10 till, and we're going to go later, and I don't know how much longer, how much later, but later, because we have to get through. Yes. 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 Yes.